So welcome everybody to today's webinar. Today we're going to discuss soil health and profitable decisions. As we get closer and closer to harvest, actually there's a few that have started here uh, this fall already, but as we get closer to that point and as we're making decisions for 2020, uh, 2021, and then farther in the future, it's critical that we really take a hard look at education, understanding, and success. And that's the reason that we use that as our slogan. Simply the better educated we are of any subject and the better understanding that we have of said subject or subjects, the easier it is to make better decisions. And at a point in time in farming where finances are very, very tight, if we choose to change something or if we simply choose to take something out, uh, that meaning if we're going to eliminate P and K, and yes, there are reasons to do so, um, but also reasons to be able to do so very, very profitably and effectively, we have to have a better understanding. And simply because we've done something for the last 20, 50 or more years doesn't always make it right. Um, prior to myself being born, I'm 38 years old today, um, it was uh, it was very common for pregnant women to uh, maybe drink some alcohol and smoke cigarettes uh, with you know babies still in them, and that was considered to be safe and normal. Well, that you know as of today we know is not safe, and it was very detrimental to developing babies. And so again, just because we've done something for a long, long time, has never will make it right. And so that brings us to the point of, of challenging very tightly held beliefs and thoughts. Um, when we talk about challenging things, we're not being disrespectful to anybody, um, anybody's past success or future success or anybody in this industry. There's simply too many things that we do today that are considered normal. And these things that are considered normal in a lot of cases are costing us money. They're costing us profit but it's also contributing to uh, incidences of pests, of weeds, of insects, of diseases, of other pests that are only continuing to get worse, not get better. And so with that said, we're gonna move on. Uh, through the webinar, you can text me uh, at my cell phone number here. We'll do our best to go through all of these and at the end of the meeting, um, <clears throat> answer those. Our goal here today is to discuss soil health and profitable decisions for 45 to 50 minutes, and then get through the questions and hopefully be on here for an hour, maybe a little bit less. And so when we started down the biological or regenerative road, <clears throat> back um, wholeheartedly back in about 2014, often the question was asked, where do I start? And we would often say, well, it starts with looking at a soil test because there's, there's things there that we need to look at to be able to understand what about, uh, what's going on in your soils. Uh, over the last few years though, a couple years especially, um, where do we start has changed and where we start actually starts with your mindset. And that mindset of being open-minded, of being willing to change, of being willing to ask questions, to ask why, to have that uh, two or three year old type mentality of why, 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 why. I have a two year old and four year old at home and, and they both ask that question repeatedly and, and I'll admit sometimes it drives me nuts, but then I get to thinking about the educational process and goals of agribiosystems, and it's something that we should all be asking more. Well, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Why are we using this? Why are we using that? Now, if that question becomes or gets brought up repeatedly, I will question, you know, how much someone might be paying attention, and that has happened. But um, don't be afraid to ask why, especially if it's things that you don't quite understand or things that we haven't covered before because it is critical to your success and your operation success. Um, and ultimately, what are your operations goals in the next three, five, and 10 years? There are so many cases here recently and as we look ahead to next year and the future, um, we hear the comment of, oh my God, we've got to get through this year before we can ever think about 
two years, three years, five years, 10 years down the road. But once again, this is where the mindset comes into play. And as we look to create a more profitable farming operation, a more resilient soil system, one that can help mitigate the majority of the stress effects of mother nature, starting to think two, three, five, 10 years down the road becomes again, imperative to your success. And so we challenge you to do a lot of different things. Uh, number one, challenge yourself to be open-minded. Accept change and rock the conventional boat. If you look at uh, the, the, some of the guys like Randy Dowdy, David Hula, uh, Kevin Kalb, some of these others that have consistently done well in corn growers trials, how do you think they got there? Um, I know some of you don't really care uh, and don't think contest trials have anything to do with broad acre farming, but it can. And it's, it's helped them be very successful and make better decisions for their, their, their general broad acre uh, management decisions. Now, if you, if you don't put emphasis into corn growers type trials, how about the ones that are growing 300 bushel corn with zero applied fertility? That's no nitrogen, no phosphorus, no potassium, no sulfur, no nothing. It's being done today. Uh, how about organic growers who are producing exceptionally high corn yields? Now, organic doesn't uh, necessarily make things better, and there seems to be this uh, kind of war within agriculture today of organic being significantly better. And in a lot of cases, it's actually not. Uh, simply due to continued degradation of soils in the amount of time uh, or amount of uh, tillage passes that uh, organic producers are using. And so, no, organic doesn't necessarily mean better, especially from a nutrient perspective. Now, again, with that said, there are some folks in organic systems uh, that are also regenerative, that are producing very high quality crops, very nutrient dense crops. And so again, ask questions, do the self-education you need. You know, you don't have to do it on every acre, but give it an honest effort, three to five years on maybe five to 10% of your acres if, if you have interest in the things that we do. And it's not just us, it's others uh, in the regenerative farming world. Uh, number two, challenge the conventional management mindset. And every one of those who think because it's worked for the last 20 plus years, that it's the correct way. Uh, we had an article recently pub published uh, in the Illinois Agri News, and, and there was a, a quote in there about conventional management wasn't working. Uh, and it was a quote of mine. Anytime we've ever said conventional systems don't work, it doesn't mean you can't be successful with conventional management, because you can. And uh, the vast majority of us and or you have been generally in the past. What this means though, when we say that conventional systems don't work or the things that we were doing, the things we were challenging to get to where we are today, that they weren't working is this. A vast majority of the NP and K that we were applying to soils was not making it into plants. Um, our insects, our diseases, again, many of our pests have only continued to get worse. Uh, we have now have uh, dicamba resistant water hemp pigweed and other weeds. Um, that was supposed to be the, you know, kind of the holy grail that uh, was going to save us from some of our weed problems. Folks, it's biology that also controls the weeds that you will fight. And so you fix your soils, you fix your true fertility and balance. Many of those weeds that we fight today, they will not germinate in soils. Um, and again, the whole, well, it's worked for the last 20 years, and so we're going to continue to do it. Uh, just because you apply any fertilizer or any nutrient has never and will never guarantee it becomes plain available. That again is also a biological process. Number three, challenge yourself to put more control in your favor by having soils that actually work for you instead of you working for your soils. This is a different concept for most because most still today think that we have to work soils and there's places where that still needs to be done. 
Um, if we have severe compaction layers today, and especially severe compaction layers in high magnesium soils, there's still some tillage needs to be done. But the goal needs to be to manage that effectively to get to the point where you can move to a reduced or even a new no-till situation. And finally, challenges to make sure we're doing the things we need to be doing to make sure that we get you there. Uh, we often also say that conventional systems and biological systems don't mix, and that's 100% true, and here's why. Many of the things that are done today from a conventional aspect or conventional management perspective completely negate the work that beneficial soil biology should be doing for soils and plants, and humans for that matter. And so if we're making decisions uh, in utilizing some of the agribio systems products, we're taking four or five steps forward, but then we're also doing things that uh, now we're taking two, three, four, five, six, or more steps backwards. What have we done? Well, we've essentially just wasted more time and money. Um, again, we don't expect anybody to completely jump in, both feet forward first, and completely change how they're doing things on every acre in one year. Uh, in some cases, that it can actually be a uh, a recipe for a disaster um, because we do have to earn the right to make some of these changes with soils. But if you choose to use our system and our products, give it an honest shot for three to five years and do everything that you need to do to make it work properly to prove it to yourself. Um, we don't know it all. We're never going to. That's why we continue to learn. That's why we continue to do trials. Why do we do the things that we do? There's nobody in this world that knows everything about everything. And that's one of the downfalls of agronomy today is there are a lot of people who think they have it all figured out. But once again, for those in farming today who are doing some very unconventional things, who are consistently producing very unconventional results, how did they get there? And it wasn't by following our current agronomy books, thoughts, practices, et cetera. The single largest issue with consistent farm profits today, in a lot of cases, actually isn't yield. Um, now, genetic potential of an acre of a cor uh, corn is 1,100 bushel the acre. We generally consider anything above 200 to be very good. Well, folks, that's less than 20% of the genetic potential. Now, is 1,100 realistic today? No, it's not. Um, but there are many cases where 300 plus is more realistic than many of you probably believe. Now, with that said, there are some soils today that are so poor and so degraded that all the money in the world probably wouldn't enable you to hit some of those things. And so, um, once again, education understanding is very critical, but the single largest issue with consistent farm profitability is simply this. We have the wrong expectations of our soils. For too long, we have uh, looked at dirt, and there is a difference between dirt and soil. We look at it as only being the medium that holds plants upright. And in many cases in the past several years, dirt even does a poor job of this. And so what should a healthy and functional soil actually do? Well, number one, it should decompose toxins. Number two, it should hold water. Uh, number three, it should infiltrate water, and it should do both of those at the same time. Um, it should also hold and provide all plant essential minerals. And even those that are not deemed essential today, it should control pathogens. But there's so much today that actually if healthy functioning soil can and should do, we don't understand those expectations. And that's why many of us uh, feel the way we do and the reason that we do a lot of things we do in terms of management. And so looking at this picture here, um, this is two corn plants, two root systems, uh, essentially root balls from the same soil type, different fields, completely different management practices. <clears throat> These two are, were dug just basically right across the road from one another. And so, which one of these, if you were to pick, which one would you choose? The one on the left or the one on the right? Of course, there's some vast, vast differences. 
The one on the left you can see has very good aggregate structure. The one on the right has zero aggregate structure and has several density layers. Uh, it has the appearance of being a very, very tight soil. And so looking at this, which one's going to allow for more efficient water infiltration? Which one has more oxygen? And which is an environment that favors aerobic beneficial soil microbes? Soil biology, beneficial soil biology, like humans basically needs three things, food, water, and shelter. But in, in soil biology's case, it's more, it's about optimum temperature, good gas exchange, and water. Now, if we have this in soils, those beneficial soil microbes are going to have essentially that food, water, shelter that they need. They're going to be able to build the aggregate structure like the uh, plant and root system here and soil system on the left compared to the right. Um, and we often talk and, and, and probably need, need to do a, a little better job of, of explaining, but it's not just about oxygen levels as in soil, it is about gas exchange. And so soils and microbes, essentially they breathe in oxygen gas and nitrogen gas and they expel CO2. And CO2 is something that is needed tremendously by plants. It is often one of the largest yield limiting factors in building successful plants and yields. So the pivotal decision in the plant soil and soil microbe system uh, can often also be called the micro bridge or do the decisions that I make on a daily and yearly basis support or detract from making this system work for my soils? As we're making this decisions, are the decisions we're making, are they synergies or are they antagonists? Are they supporting this goal or are they detracting from this goal? And there's too much today that is still taken away from this goal. And so this nutrient interaction chart shows uh, basically four different pies. And in the northeast or the top right uh, quadrants, you have your onion uh, macros and secondaries. In the, the top left or the northwest, you have your cation macros and secondaries. And then in the bottom two, you have your micros. And so as we're looking to make better decisions, one of the things that we have dealt with for years that uh, simply to, for people who have not used SAP testing or haven't used it enough, we think because a little is good that maybe a lot's better. And so if you look here at the, the top right quadrant here, where we have nitrate, sulfur, chloride, and phosphorus, these all can, can support each other if those minerals are in uh, the right amounts. But if they are not in the right amounts, they, can, they become tremendously antagonistic to one another. It can be the same way with the cations here, uh, cations here in the bottom left, and the anion micros here on the bottom right. But again, back to this top right one. If we choose to apply boatloads of nitrogen, and as that uh, converts in the soil, we do stand a chance of suppressing the uptake of sulfur, chloride, and phosphorus. Chloride is an essential mineral. One that um, we do talk about being negative an, an awful lot because too much of this one is very negative. We'll get a little bit more of that later. But too much nitrate can suppress all of these. Too much sulfate can suppress nitrate, chloride, phosphorus. Too much chloride can suppress nitrate, sulfur, phosphorus. Too much phosphorus can suppress the uptake of these three. And again, it goes for the same in all of these quadrants. Now, where this becomes a problem is if we are trying to improve BRICS levels by improving photosynthesis, which is sugar production, and photosynthesis being the factory that drives everything in plant development and drives everything in trying to grow crops that are very, very healthy and can be immune to both diseases and insects without the use of pesticides, this graph becomes very critical to understand. Because if we do have high nitrate levels within a plant and we don't have the proper uh, systems or proper micronutrients to balance those excessive, excessive nitrate levels, we're going to suppress the uptake of sulfur and phosphorus. 
And these two also do play a role in photosynthesis. By the same token, if we think that we have to apply a boatload of potash or our common potassium chloride fertilizer, which is 60% potassium, 40% chloride, we're going to suppress then the uptake of nitrate, sulfur, and phosphorus. We're actually going to show a SAP test here uh, later in the webinar to help you better understand some of these things. But keeping this graph in mind as we're trying to make better decisions is very, very critical. Um, real fast, right back to the nitrate piece and trying to balance this. You can apply all the sulfur, all the phosphorus, and the, the four other minerals, or even uh, three others, um, that have a tremendous role in how much sugar we are actually producing in photosynthesis. But if we have high nitrate levels in the plant and we don't, we're not focusing on balancing that or bringing that down, we will never improve our BRICS levels. We'll never change the complete immunity of the plant on its own. So as we look to move forward, and in too many cases, we still think that we have to, we have to apply X amounts of nitrogen, X amounts of phosphorus, X amounts of potassium. In PK. For one, those aren't the three most critical nutrients in plant growth. It's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But you've been told for so many years that you have to have so much of those. 79% of air we breathe is nitrogen gas. In the same manner of how soybeans and other legumes actually can pull that nitrogen gas into the soil or even into the plant via their relationship with rhizobium bacteria. That same relationship can exist with other beneficial soil microbes for grass plants such as corn. But you've been told for many years you have to have them, right? And certainly the profitability of trying to build soil levels, uh, let alone build and maintain in the last several years has been very questionable from a profitability perspective. But other than someone telling you that yields will crash or you'll mine your soils or whatever it might be, if you don't at least do maintenance removal rates, how do you know? I've had a few comments made over the last two years of, well, you know, we, we haven't applied any phosphorus or any potassium just because we didn't think we could afford it. And yields have been tremendous. Now, Mining soils uh, kind of falsely or a pseudo mining is possible if you are not also using biology because it's biology that continually mineralizes and releases minerals from soil. But once again, if you haven't actively tested this by doing check strips or doing in-season sap testing, how do you know? But even if you think you're doing the right thing without doing some in-season sap testing, to actually have a nutrient report card at different periods throughout the growing season, once again, how do you know? We have too many decisions that are simply considered normal that are costing us money that in some cases are actually causing as many problems as they're doing us any good. Excess applications of NP and K fertilizers, not understanding mineral balance in soils, not understanding the importance of calcium and magnesium ratios, the use of uh, fungicides, the use of other pesticides, uh, the thought of, well, the only way to control weeds is via herbicides. Folks, there's simply too many things that we don't have a great understanding of. But we've done some of these things for so long, we think we have to have them, kind of like an addict. And our soils today generally are addicts as well. They need their fix. There's more money wasted every year on NP and K than any other input, and especially P and K. Everything we do revolves around a system, and how that system operates is dependent on the efficiency. The micronutrients don't work. In other words, they don't get into plants and perform their functions without the proper micronutrients or secondaries. The method and how nitrogen actually gets into a plant is it first has to bind itself to calcium. We don't have enough calcium, we've got problems. 
Phosphorus needs copper and zinc. Potassium needs manganese and calcium. But every single mineral needs calcium and boron. The majority of plant diseases that we face are actually due to deficiencies of calcium and phosphorus. Others can play a role in that, but take Diplodia irot, for example, in, in corn production. It is uh, commonly said by people in this industry that you cannot control Diplodia. It's something that just happens. And when we bring this up and we actually provide um, some systems and some, some solutions to how to protect ourselves, we get blank stares. And so who do you believe? That's up to you. But Diplodia irrot is generally caused because we have deficiencies of calcium and phosphorus. Generally, it's also because of lack of photosynthesis. But our mi micronutrients and trace minerals serve multiple purposes. And so why should you not apply phosphorus, especially as DAP or triple super? It's been known for years that phosphorus applied in the fall, only roughly 30% will be plant available come spring. Yet we continue to do it because we have the, the thought or the expectation well, at some point in time will become available and that also is not necessarily true. New data from Iowa State University now proves that 90% of applied phosphorus is tied up within 30 days. Why should we ever consider spending money on anything? that 90% of it will not be available to do its job in 30 days or less. Here's another situation where in season sap testing, not just one test in a field in a year, but multiple, multiple tests take one or two areas and do it every couple of weeks. It's going to help you realize the things that we helped or that we started to realize back in 2013. Phosphorus is very easily tied up by calcium, iron, aluminum in the soil. And the only way to supply constant plant available phosphorus is via constant mineralization. To do this, we have to have an enzyme called phosphatase. Enzymes are also created by the beneficial soil microbes, but for them to do it, they also need the corresponding proper microbes and trace elements. Top six inches of soil also contains on average 9,000 pounds of total phosphorus. Now this is based on total soil testing analysis. This isn't based on the conventional soil analysis today where you'd get back, say, a soluble or exchangeable level or number. So a few case studies from past years on phosphorus. We've experienced <clears throat> phosphorus levels, P1 braid levels, increased by as much as 220 pounds in the same growing season with no phosphorus applied. In the spring of 2018, um, grower purchased a new farm. No phosphorus was applied based on our recommendation. The initial grid sample done on May 15th showed roughly 20, <clears throat> roughly 20 percent of the acres showed a Bray P1 level of between 10 and 20 pounds. Uh, he called, was concerned, and, and rightfully so, especially for um, one that maybe uh, didn't have the, the proper education. Um, going into something like this. But uh, we went back to make a long story short and we spot sampled all of those areas on June 15th, exactly 20 days later. And so what do you think the results were? Were they the same? And that's also another common misconception of soil testing. And it's something that's still important. It's something that gives us a, a target or a benchmark. But those numbers will change daily, weekly, and monthly depending on soil conditions in the environment. Those numbers will not stay the same. And so if you're making decisions based on a soil test that is one point in time for three, four, or five years, you might want to reconsider how you're doing things. Because those numbers will change. They are not static. So 20 days later, there was not a single soil test point it was less than 60. Now, if you tried to do that with actual fertilizer, you couldn't afford to do it, especially in one year. We did it on a program that was less than $25 an acre. <clears throat> potassium and why you should not apply it, especially as potassium chloride. 
Number one, it's 40% chloride. It's one of the most detrimental products to soil biology and efficiencies. If you recall back to the nutrient uh, antagonism chart, you'll recall that excess chloride in a plant can su suppress the uptake of nitrate, sulfur, and phosphorus, all three very critical minerals. But when potassium chloride is applied and the chloride becomes in contact with acid fertilizer, such as DAP or triple super, it forms hydrochloric acid, which also kills beneficial soil biology it comes in contact with, also reducing the availability of calcium and iron. Calcium, again, is one of the most predominant minerals that is deficient in plants when it comes to plant diseases. Iron, and especially the form that can be uptaken and properly used by plants, is also one of the critical nutrients needed for photosynthesis. And so that chloride that doesn't form hydrochloric acid combines with other minerals to form chloride salts that cause soil dehydration, radical pH changes, and salinization. When potassium chloride combines with nitrate in the soil, half of this chloride forms a hypochlorous acid, the main chemical used in swimming pool disinfectants. The other half forms chloride gas that moves to the atmosphere. This gas is also very toxic to beneficial microbes, including humans. It's also heavier than air and lies close to the soil surface in low areas. And so when this gas contacts rain or other forms of precipitation, it forms acid rain that is once again detrimental to soil life. And this excess chloride again in plants will suppress the uptake of nitrate nitrogen, which is needed for vegetative growth, phosphorus, and sulfur. Here again is this nutrient interaction chart. Keep this chart in mind as you are formulating or making decisions. And if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Let us know. So one more slide on potassium. Soils that don't function properly, again, are like drug addicts. Drug addicts, they need their fix. The use of potassium chloride also leads to compacted soils due to continued degradation of organics, which is pretty much nothing more degradation of soil carbon levels. If you recall back to last winter's meetings, we did show and prove the importance in the correlation of active carbon levels and final yield. And just as phosphorus, um, on average, soils contain 35 to 40,000 pounds of total potassium in the top six inches alone. So why do we use a fall residue digester program? Well, a 200 bushel corn crop leaves in the residue roughly the following amounts of minerals, 90 pounds of nitrogen, 40 pounds of phosphorus, and 220 pounds of potassium. And so if you were to compare this to actual fertilizer costs today, what's this residue worth? But also, what's this residue worth if those minerals don't stay in the soil? Well, today, they'd be close to $100 an acre. This is one of the reasons we now have fields that are, uh, have been soil tested annually, now for nine years, and we have not seen a negative change in soil P and K levels with no P and K applied. We're doing a better job of recycling minerals. We're also doing a better job of unlocking tied up minerals in the soil profile. And so I'd asked a question just a minute ago about the importance of making sure that those minerals in that residue stay there. Um, some soils are so badly degraded that the remaining residue looks as though it has that golden type harvest color even long after harvest in some cases in the next spring. Here's a case where there's very little, if any, breakdown and recycling of nutrients occurring here. Also, if residue is not broken down by, if the residue is broken down by non-beneficial anaerobes, most of those minerals are also lost to the atmosphere. Many of our non-beneficials also can produce compounds such as antibiotics to slow the digestion of residue. Most of the pathogens have to have that proper environment to survive. And 
that residue is one of those things. And so if they're producing antibiotics that is uh, doing harm or detriment to beneficials, it's one of, the, one of the things that they can do is they actually can produce those different compounds that slows or inhibits some of the growth of beneficials. And so how do we change it? We simply change the environment. We outnumber them. So one of the things that, that we should also be doing during the season to have a better idea of some of the decisions or some of the practices that I am utilizing, how can I test it in season? One of those, again, is sap testing. It's something we've used since 2013. In the last two years alone, we've probably, um, AgriBiosystems alone, probably has spent twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year on sap testing for trials, for learning, for education, simply doing the things that we need to do. But it's similar to do it to a traditional tissue test, though the results can be far, far different. Um, traditional tissue testing, in our opinion, is pr pretty much a complete waste of time and money because there's no scientific data or evidence behind the sufficiency ranges. Their only data or evidence behind it, their averages. Their averages of all the tissue samples ever sent to said lab. SAP testing is a different, there is differences there. It actually measures the xylem and the phloem and the minerals that are extracted from that tissue. It is one of the best and most consistent in season tests that can be done to help you better understand plant health, soil health, microbial activity. And once again, are the things that I'm doing, are they working? Rather than taking the, uh, the response or the, the mindset of, well, it's worked for the last X amount of years, prove it to yourself. The other thing is a refractometer or BRICS testing, where we can actively manage sugar production during the growing season. And so here is a copy of, of, one, of uh, one of the sap tests from this growing season. Now, generally, there'll be, uh, there'll be two different color bars, a light green and a dark green. The light green would be the new or the young growth. The dark green is the old growth. Uh, here, the sample that was sent in, we, don't, we didn't uh, apparently send uh, enough tissue of the new growth for proper analysis, and so they left it off. But with that said, there are still some things that can be learned here because you have certain minerals within a plant that are mobile and you have certain ones that are not mobile and a few that maybe fit somewhere in between. But if you look at uh, the chart here, uh, here on the left, uh, here would be the deficient area in the middle, sufficient, and to the right, excess or high. Well, out of the, um, several parameters or factors that are being tested, we have very few that are insufficient. Um, do have two excessive, uh, one of those being magnesium and the other one being aluminum. Um, total sugars actually here, they're in pretty decent shape. Uh, electric conductivity is in okay shape, sodium sufficient. Chloride, again, is an essential mineral, but when chloride levels within a plant are higher, than total nitrogen, when they are higher than phosphorus, when they're higher than sulfur, we have problems. Chloride is very easily uptaken by plants. And once again, we've created an issue of a comprised or um, lowered plant immunity because of poor mineral balance within a plant. One of the things that caused that was the potassium chloride application. The other thing here, high aluminum levels, an indication of high amounts of DAP fertilizer being applied. And so there's things we can look at um, very, very quickly and seeing on a SAP test of some of the practices that maybe have or have not been done. Once again, invest some money in SAP test for next year. It'll help you understand a lot of the things that we've been preaching to you folks about for the last several years. So the importance of photosynthetic efficiency. Um, here we have uh, two different comparisons, one at a 20% photosynthetic rate and one at 60%. We have a comparison of the total carbon per acre produced in the growing season 
but then how all of this carbon then is utilized in within the plant and the soil. Again, here this winter we we uh, we showed uh, the end of a three-year trial where we finally did come up with the correlation of final yield, and that was not with soil test levels of potassium and phosphorus. It was active carbon. And active car carbon in general, making up 45% of total plant biomass and thus yield the importance of photosynthesis and building more carbon within soils. When we're in uh, corn production, especially in grain field, we have high nighttime temperatures. Those temperatures above 70 degrees creates an environment where plants cannot rest. They can't slow down. And so the sugars that might be, or the sugars that are produced in photosynthesis during the day are then used at night simply for plant maintenance. <coughs> Sorry, plant maintenance. When this happens, in a lot of cases, we may actually completely stop root exudates being, being pushed out of the root system to feed the beneficial soil biology to do their job of providing the plant nutrition that the plant says it needs. When this happens, we also stand to uh, create environments for root rots and crown rots and things to start. So this again, photosynthesis is not just about sugar production. I mean, essentially it, it is, but it's about understanding <clears throat> how do we produce, how do we have plants that are completely immune to plant diseases and insects? How do we build a more efficient, a more resilient soil system? Starts with photosynthesis. So uh, to, to finish up here um, fairly quickly, um, Martins have a trial on their farm this year. Uh, they've been tremendous to work with for the last several years. They're pretty much willing to do about anything that we want to do. But uh, we had plans this year in several cases to have uh, trials where we only applied 50 pounds of total nitrogen. That was it. And the Martins were actually the only one that got any of these done. And so they have 15 acres there at their farm. And so <clears throat> you can see here the, the picture on the left we have an ear that the kernels are significantly larger than the ear here on the bottom. The picture here on the right, um, the, the ears to the left, these are the ears that came out of the 50 pounds of total nitrogen. The ones in the middle come from 120, the ones on the right come from 150 total pounds. <clears throat> and so in a year like this where we've had excessive rainfall and just been uh, absolutely just beaten and beaten and beaten with poor weather, um, how is it possible, one, in a good year to produce very high yields on very little fertilizers applied, and especially nitrogen, as it pertains to corn? Once again, how do you do that in a good year? But two, how do you do that in a year where weather has been almost completely against us? From the excessive saturation in cold soils early through um, even early summer to then five to six weeks with almost no rainfall, how do we do this? And this is something that is, in a lot of cases, is, is easier and more realistic than what you might expect. And so here again, you have a kernel from the 50 pound nitrogen corn on the left, 120 on the right. How are these kernels bigger? Well, once again, everything's a system and it's about balance. And if we're short a mineral or several minerals, we don't have balance and plants can't do the things that they need to do to increase production, increase efficiency. One of the things we actually did here by not applying so much nitrogen, we didn't suppress things within the plants. We didn't suppress other mineral uptake. And so within the plant, we have better balance. Plants offer a better start, um, is healthier, which you will see in, in a picture here in a second as well. But it's allowed for the production of bigger kernels. Once again, it's not just NP and K. I and mean, it's certainly not just because we apply something, the plant can get it. Because over application of certain, herf, uh, certain fertilizers and certain minerals actually, again, suppresses the uptake of others. And so here's an uh, infield picture, um, maybe not the most notable, but take, take a look pretty closely here at the lower third of the plants here on the left versus the lower third of the plants here on the right. 
The right's actually 120 pounds applied nitrogen. You see it has much more firing, much more completely dead or necrotic tissue that those plants had robbed the majority of those mobile nutrients, mainly nitrogen in this case, out of those lower leaves to feed the upper part of the plants. Where here in the bottom part, you do still see a decent amount of green tissue with 70 pounds less total nitrogen applied. So again, how's this possible? And there's two reasons. It has to do with nutrient cycling and taking advantage of free nitrogen. And so what form do minerals have to be in to be so-called plant available? Well, conventional agronomy is gonna say soluble. And there's some truth to this, especially for root uptake. But what's the problem with soluble mineral in the soil, especially in a year of the just extreme saturation that we just went through. They're susceptible to loss. That's the problem. And this is why the hypoxia zone in the, down in the Gulf of New Mexico is at record levels or, or record wide area. And if we don't start to do a better job of managing our soils, you don't need any more government interaction in your business. You don't need the EPA or anybody telling you how and when to do things. But if we're not careful, it's right down the road. So again, <clears throat> this nutrient loss leads to money loss. Something that right now, I mean, even if corn was $5, we don't want nutrient money loss, but at 350 corn, it's much worse. So how can one protect these soluble minerals? And your common synthetic stabilizers like Inserve and Agritain, uh, Nutrisphere, they're nothing more than band-aids that might address some symptoms for a short period of time, but they will never fix the true problem. And so the solution then is creating plant available yet insoluble minerals. And this is where the, co the, the concept of nutrient cycling comes into play. Big fish eat little fish, the predator prey relationship. This is something that uh, the 10 minute video that we put together last fall <clears throat> on the uh, homepage of our website at agribiosystems.com, we talk about nutrient cycling. We talk about this big fishy little fish, but it's how we protect these minerals. And so you have here uh, this uh, clear uh, kind of oblong creature. This is a protozoa. And all these little dots within this protozoa, these are bacteria, and it's beneficial protozoa that feed on these bacteria. And all these little dots here too, which the microscope's a little bit out of focus, these are also bacteria. And so you have several different trophic levels of the soil food web. And every one of these trophic levels has an optimum carbon to nitrogen ratio. And not just carbon to nitrogen, carbon to phosphorus, carbon to potassium, carbon to manganese, carbon to zinc, carbon to every single mineral. And so bacteria have a, have a carbon to nitrogen or C to N ratio of five to one. Protozoa have a C to N ratio of 30 to one. Again, protozoa feed on bacteria. Protozoa C to N ratio is 30 to one. So to, to, to obtain their 30 carbons, they eat five bacteria. Well, in doing so, then they have too many nitrogens, and so they then excrete five out in an ammonium form that is immediately plant available. But because of this nutrient cycling process, and when these bacteria are still consumed um, by protozoa, or in the case of fungi being uh, fed on by beneficial nematodes, yes, beneficial nematodes do exist, this is how we create insoluble yet plant available minerals. And this, this process constant, is constantly cycling if you have the right ones and the right numbers there. And so we, again, it starts with the mindset number two, if you recall back to the picture showing the soil with aggregate structure and the one that is severely, severely compacted, then it leads to systems and management decisions that actively build stable aggregate structures because you have to have stable aggregate structures 
to allow the soil food web and nutrient cycling to occur. On the free nitrogen side, 79% of the air we breathe every day is nitrogen gas. And just as legumes have the relationships with certain strains of rhizobium bacteria to make this nitrogen gas plant available, the same relationship exists for grass plants such as corn. Now, it may not be quite as efficient as rhizobium and legumes, but it still provides the opportunity to take advantage of a very, very significant free nitrogen source. It's also what has allowed some people to consistently produce 300 bushel corn with zero pounds of applied fertility. Nothing at all. Now, for this also to happen, you must have these specific microbes present. You must also have enough molybdenum and boron, and we must also achieve consistent photosynthesis level levels at 60% or greater. If you recall back to uh, comparing 20% photosynthesis versus 60%, what that looks like in terms of BRICS levels, carbon produced and how it's used, go back and look at those slides. And so, this picture, or these two pictures, they show two conventional nutrient deficiencies. The one on the left, of course, is nitrogen. We've seen a significant amount of that here this year because of degraded soils, excessive rainfall, the ability to not hold it, et cetera. But the one on the right is magnesium. But from a conventional perspective, what does this actually mean? Are we actually short nitrogen and magnesium? as conventional agronomy suggests. And so I encourage you to do some research. And if you want some specific places to look, let me know. But today we're not gonna give this answer because I wanna encourage you to do some of your own research, do some of your own digging and finding. But can these symptoms or deficiencies be fixed without applying the minerals that are so-called deficient here? In other words, can we fix the nitrogen deficiency in a corn plant without actually applying nitrogen? And in case of this magnesium deficiency, number one, what actually caused it? And number two, can we fix it without applying magnesium? And so do some digging, do some searching. Again, the ultimate key to your success is your mindset. And this mindset can be one of two things. It's worked for, for the last X amount of years, so why change now? Or I realize there are more efficient and profitable management styles. And if this second one is the road that you want to go down, maintaining a completely open mind with an unwavering willingness to change is paramount to your success. I thank you uh, for taking the time to listen to this today. Um, as as uh, always, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact us. We, we are here to help. We're here to educate and help you understand things, help you make better decisions to lead to higher profits. So thanks again. Have a great harvest.